My name is Dr. Mary McDermott. I am chair of the Peripheral Vascular Disease Council for the American Heart Association. And I'm here with Dr. Heather Gornick from the Cleveland Clinic and Dr. Ericles Pepinos from the University of Nebraska. And we just came from a very exciting session on the contemporary management of peripheral arterial disease that, that uh, Dr. Gornick and Dr. Pepino spoke at and, and led. And I'm going to just be talking to each of them about their presentations. So starting with you, Dr. Gornick, you spoke about current management of patients with peripheral arterial disease. And I wondered if you could just summarize when you treat your patients with peripheral arterial disease, what therapy do you ensure that they're on to prevent cardiovascular events? Well, I think a lot of it depends on what, what they're taking when they come to see me. And I think there are many patients, believe it or not, who come to see me for leg pain, and it's the first time anyone has really done an ABI and they're diagnosed de novo for peripheral artery disease. And on those patients, they'll probably leave my office on three medications. Definitely on an antiplatelet medication, usually aspirin, statin if there's no contraindication. And then most patients with claudication and PAD, I will try solostazole. So they may leave my office on three medications. As we get to know each other over time and they come back and follow up, their medical program may be further fine-tuned. I may add an ACE inhibitor or ARB, but um, definitely statins, antiplatelet medications, and I do try solostazole if they claudicate. And you mentioned the fact that many patients with peripheral arterial disease are not necessarily on the optimal therapy to prevent cardiovascular events. Why do you think that is? Well, I think it's a combination of factors. I think, unfortunately, PAD is a bit of an orphan disease. I talked about that a little bit this morning. Uh, in the cardiovascular community, even in the Heart Association, I think we've always been very focused on coronary heart disease, stroke, and now are really just recognizing PAD as a third or fourth member of the atherosclerotic triumvirate that causes a lot of disease. So I think there's under recognition among healthcare providers. Um, I think there's a little bit of a uh, knowledge gap and clinical trial gap and ev evidence gap. We don't have as many trials that have specifically focused on these therapies in PAD patients. I do think things are getting better over time, but I think there's still a lot of work to do. You also talked about the fact that there are very few medical therapies for patients with peripheral arterial disease and you mentioned that supervised exercise is very effective, but most people with peripheral arterial disease do not participate in a supervised exercise program. Can you tell us why that is? Sure, and, it, and it's uh, fitting that I'm talking about supervised exercise therapy with you and, and you as well, because you both are people who are doing terrific research in this field. I mean, as you know, supervised exercise is so effective for PAD patients but unfortunately, it's not reimbursed by most insurance companies and by Medicare. And for that reason, as you both know, it's not available to most of our patients. I often try to get around this. If my PAD patients also have coronary disease and angina, I'll call the rehab and ask that the program be tailored to claudication or PAD, but it really is a challenge. Thank you. And now, Dr. Pepinos, you spoke to us this morning about the pathophysiology of functional impairment in people with peripheral arterial disease. And one of the things that you mentioned is that the pathophysiology of peripheral arterial disease is a lot more complex than just a problem with supply and demand of blood flow. Could you tell us more about that? Yes, uh, we all know that things in PAD, things start with blockages in the arteries that supply the legs. But um, uh, our group and others, including yours, has shown that there is a lot more to that. And uh, we, can, we, have, we are trying to understand what happens in these patients um, and essentially answer the question, when a leg over time, sometimes many years, sees very low blood flow, what happens to the ischemic limb and its components? And I think uh, our group, uh, the findings of our group, are demonstrating that every tissue in the ischemic limb accumulates damage over time. Uh, we are very interested in muscle because of its uh, 
functional uh, significance with ambulation, but also overall function of uh, the PAD patient. But I think uh, every tissue in the leg suffers, including nerves, skin, subcutaneous tissues. And I think this accumulating damage over time is what produces the manifestations of PAD, which, um, uh, as you know, include claudication, inability to walk, um, rest pain, and uh, tissue loss, gangrene. Another thing that you focused on this morning was the mitochondria in the muscle, and you mentioned that even after revascularization, the muscle function typically doesn't return to normal. Can you speak a little bit more about that? Yes. Um, our work, um, work from our laboratory and others, um, including Dr. Hyatt's, uh, has demonstrated that the mitochondria uh, in um, the muscle uh, are dysfunctional. Actually, to back up a little bit, this, um, the damage in the muscle, uh, the main characteristics of this damage include myofiber degeneration with necrosis and replacement by scar tissue and fat cells. Um, and in terms of its biochemistry, there is evidence of significant mitochondrial dysfunction, evidence of oxidative damage, and evidence of inflammation. Um, I think um, the, uh, our findings show that sometimes, actually most of the times, the limb has accumulated so much damage by the time we attempt to improve it with medications or revascularization or exercise therapy that the outcomes of the treatment um, do not return it back to normal. There is, there are, uh, and that is the reason why we see improvements in uh, walking distances, for example. But these imp improvements are nowhere close to what a normal person ambulates on a daily basis or on a treadmill. And uh, uh, so, in our laboratory, we're trying to understand exactly what type of damage we have and how does it respond to t standard therapy, be it revascularization or exercise. And we're in the process of um, coming up with some answers. Hopefully in uh, the upcoming ATVB meetings we will be able to share more. Great, thank you very much. Thank you. I want to thank you both for the wonderful presentations this morning. Uh, we really had a terrific session discussing contemporary management of peripheral arterial disease. So thank you for your attention. Thank you.